and we're live. Hi, Hi everyone. <laughs> um, I'm Petrina from the APDT and um, welcome to Train Your Dog Month 2023. We've got a full month of guests. We've had guests on all week talking about all different things, gun dogs, um, how to choose a dog trainer, all sorts of subjects. It's been absolutely brilliant. Um, and we've got more to come. So um, tonight I'm joined by Denise Armstrong. Welcome, Denise. Hello. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so, um, yes, you're going to be listening to me waffling on about my setters, training setters and everything to do with setters that I know of in as short a piece of time as I can. So um, when we're ready, I'll uh, start the presentation if you want to. Yeah, Laura said she's here. Good evening. She said she's here, so that's good. Great. OK, well, I'll take you on to the screen share. OK, brilliant. OK, there we go. So can we see my lovely little setters pause? Yes. Cool. Fabulous. So hi, everybody. Welcome to um, my little brief chat around setters. Um, I do not proclaim to be an expert in setters. I've just ended up living, training and working with setters. So a little bit about me and then we'll canter through this. I've got lots of little videos for you to watch because I know people like to watch moving pictures. Makes it simple. So off we go. So I'm Denise Armstrong. I'm a member of the APDT. That's my number. I have an MSc in Clinical Animal Behaviour from the University of Lincoln. I am a candidate member of the FABC. Uh, that means I'm not a full member as of yet. I'm waiting for submission of all my cases. I am ABTC registered as an ATI, Animal Training Instructor. I'm a graduate of Jean Donaldson's Academy for Dog Trainers. I'm also a graduate of the Gun Dog Trainers Academy. My number is 003. And I'm also a certified separation anxiety professional trainer. And I run Red Dog Training. So Red Dog Training is not Red Dogs as in Angry Dogs. Red Dog Training was born out of Red Setters. So that starts my link for my, um, my organisation. And um, so off we go. So I'm here to sort of uh, talk to you about setters and to put to bed some of the sort of rumours and the gossip that you hear about setters. I mean, I've heard it all. They're mad as a bunch of frogs, can't walk on a lead, have no brains, they won't recall, they're untrainable, they're hard to train, they're high exercise requirement. Mm, I've got a little bit to say about that. And retrievers, they ain't. So all of that, to me, is very much I see those as a challenge. You know, I never like to be told you can't and uh, your dogs can't. And um, so all of that I end up challenging through my training with my setters. And in this picture here, you'll see me playing tuggy, which many of the gun dog brigade would be horrified by, but playing tuggy with my English setter Watson, but more of him later on. But Tuggy in the positive modern dog training regime is the way we play with things. So why setters? So something, yes, I regularly ask myself, but um, I genuinely think they're the best dogs in the whole wide world, but we all do when we own a particular breed and we get into them. So my ownership of setters or their ownership of me began in 97. I used to work night shifts with a shift uh, working pattern. And during the daytime, it was very lonely sleeping on your own. I also needed some exercise. So we decided, my husband and I, that a dog would be the answer to our needs. So way back in 1997 um, that I actually considered it. I took some considerations on what to choose in a dog. I did actually uh, need silky haired or allergen friendly because believe it or not, even as a dog trainer, I am actually allergic to dogs. So silky haired is as close to at the time as hypoallergenic was. So um, because if I have a Labrador spike me with their hair, I come up in wheels and all sorts. It's not very nice. So silky haired it was. We also like the look of them. This is mortifying to a modern dog trainer. Why did you choose your dog? I like the look of them. Well, so did I back in 97 when we knew no different. And also a family friend once had one as a pub dog. And uh, that plays a part into Charlie's history because, yeah, pub dog, not quite what you think. And so back then there was no Internet to speak of. So our search for a dog began with uh, yellow pages, good old yellow pages. So I'm dating myself there. So our first dog. Um, was chosen, but what I didn't take into consideration 
is this little extract I'm showing you from Wikipedia. So setter silently searches for game by scent. Hunting is done systematically and methodically. When prey is encountered, the dog becomes motionless rather than chasing the game. And I can see and hear some of the setter owners in the history in, who are watching this laughing at that. Setters get their name from their distinctive stance, a crouch or a set upon finding their quarry. Once the dog has indicated where the birds are, they freeze on point, the birds are then flushed and the following guns can then get a shot in. The scent of game birds is airborne, so to sense it, the setter carries its head high and should never follow foot scent. Most setters are born with a natural proclivity to hunting. Dogs which show excitement and interest in birds are described as being birdy and trainers look for puppies that show this particular trait. Didn't know any of this back then when I chose my first setter, but there's some key words to pick out here. They search for game by scent. They're motionless rather than chasing after the game. I will laugh at that. I have pet setters, by the way, not working setters. They flush. They scent an airborne, so they're heads up and scenting rather than ground scenting. They never follow foot scent. I like a challenge. And they are born with a natural proclivity to hunting. And this is applicable to a pet setter as much as it is to a working setter. They are very birdy, whether they be pet or working. Love them. So you need to know what you're getting into. And I didn't. So here's my journey. I'm going to talk through the setters that own the past and the current of who taught me what. So here we go. My first ever dog was Bria. Lyric leading lady was her pedigree name. She was a Gordon setter and she was chosen um, because, well, she was advertised locally. Her nickname was Sweetie Pie. I used to call her Sweetie Pie. Her habit was running after her nose, more of that later. And the training that she uh, was given was basically traditional, but she had a sprinkling of new age clicker fandom with her. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So hindsight's the wonderful thing. And the reason why we, your modern dog trainers can help because we've mostly worn the t-shirt so you don't have to. And I really mean that. So she was my first ever dog. She taught me, oh my gosh, grooming, how much grooming is needed, how often you need to groom them, the types of equipment you need to groom them. And um, she was a show dog. She came from um, championship show lines. I didn't know what that meant at the time. I do now and the impact it might have on your training. But um, she also taught me that training your dog isn't the same as having a relationship. Now, training. You can have all the training you like in the world. And she was clicker trained. I bumped into somebody once and I just, he had six collies up the park and I went, how did you manage to keep all them together or do this or do that? And he said, oh, it's clicker training. I've just discovered it. 1997, this was. So I've just discovered clicker training. And I said, show me how. And I thought, bang, that's brilliant. This is going to stop her running away because that's what she used to do we would take her over the field she was get her nose up in the air we didn't know any different and she'd be gone we thought we had a recall she didn't and in fact my husband once upon a time lost her for an entire day and she came back black not black and tan but black black all over because of the Essex finest clay which is very very sticky and very difficult to get off but she also taught me that if you're going to have a setter one of my top tips for owning any form of long haired dog in this area is have to have an outside hot premix tap. Works wonders. I don't have a dog ever that doesn't like to stand to be showered because we have warm taps to, to do that. But something that she did teach me was the owner, the handler, sorry, the breeder. The breeder mentioned to me, oh, you need to be aware of bloat with these dogs. And I went, what's bloat? And she said, uh, go find a book because that's what we did, libraries, books, there was no internet really. So I learned all about bloat, uh, what bloat is. And um, I like to do a handout. There's, I have a link at the very end on bloat and you'll see why later on. But I learned what are the symptoms, what are the signs? And um, yeah, she was my first entry, entry level was a Gordon setter. Next came Billy 
his pedigree was Dean Way Silver Lining. And again, um, he was one of those dogs where if you knew what you were supposed to be doing, you wouldn't be doing what I did. And he was a pedigree, but his lineage wasn't um, health tested at the time. He was afterwards and the stud dog went on to actually win crafts, believe it or not. So he came from quite nice championship lines. His nickname was Billy Big Wheels. Why not? He was a big boy. He was lovely. His habit was swiping tea towels on pass as he went through the kitchen. Um, he would literally walk past. Tea towels would be hung on the oven and he would just swipe them and uh, carry them in his mouth. His training, he encountered transition to force free. So his training came about because I discovered that trainers did exist at that time when he came into our lives and I used the yellow pages to source my trainer because I didn't want a repeat of what Bria used to do, which was run away over the hills. So I thought I need someone to teach me and train me how to teach him to stay close. And at the same time as well, I also thought because I need training, because I don't want a dog that runs away, I'll also join a, a gun dog training group. And I tried to get into some local gun dog training groups, but um, we were an Irish red setter. We weren't a retriever so I couldn't join. And even though I said, well, can I teach my dog to retrieve? And they said, no, it's not the done thing. These days we don't do this. We're very much more inclusive, but I like a challenge. So I found that trainers did exist. We began our training journey. And um, yeah, he was, a, he was a robust dog and he had a traditional start for training and it's not something I would ever do now. And, but I also started my training journey and wanting to be a trainer towards the end of uh, middle of owning him. I discovered that pre-MAC training recall can and does work. My proudest moment, nobody ever saw it, was recalling him and my other Irish setter, who's lying here at the moment, off chasing a squirrel. And I used the squirrel chasing of the scent as his reward, for both of their reward for coming back. Nobody saw it. It was a massive recall and I was so disappointed. No cameras and videos at that point. I also learned that training plans do work and dog training isn't an art, a skill set that's available to all. And that's something I find re I'm really passionate about because I was told once when I asked a question of a dog trainer, how do you become a dog trainer? What do you do? How do you do this? And I was told, oh, it's, it's you know, a little bit of learning, but also there's an art and a skill to it. And I thought, an art? And he said, yeah, well, there's an art. There's an art to it. And I thought, well, I'm, that's it. I can't train a dog because I'm not very artistic. I don't know how to pull things together. But the skill set, I learned the skill set to do this. I also taught him to play tuggy. He was taught tuggy and uh, I was challenged on that because that was traditionalist view was that playing tuggy with a gun dog makes them bite down on a bird even harder. No, they know they're, they're intelligent. They know the difference between a tuggy toy and a bird retrieving to hand and uh, retrieving to hand. Yes, training plans. They do work. So his training uh, became quite structured as I was going through one of my training journeys and training plans worked and they helped me teach him to retrieve to hand. Training plans helped me teach him to recall. He was whistle trained. He was whistle trained for a stop and uh, he was a little super dog all rounder. He was a lovely all rounder. And for a first training dog to start my work of training with properly, um, he was brilliant. He was he's sorely missed. Saint Billy, I think my husband calls him. That's a bit much now. So on to our next dog, Charlie. Charlie, his pedigree was Milcroft Frosty Moon. The internet was starting to emerge. I did a little bit of research on getting this particular dog. I wanted a dog. I, listen to the I. I wanted a dog that I could do lots with. I wanted to have a dog that I could work, who had drive, who was gamey. And um, so I sought out uh, a pedigree. Um, they were listed on the internet. I drove all the way, way to Wales. It's a five hour trip from where we lived to see him. And then obviously five hours again to go meet him and pick him up. But again, this is wearing the T-shirt so that you guys don't have to. There was lots of red flags around my collecting him and picking him up. I mean, he came from a litter of at the time of 16 
and uh, that's a lot, a lot of puppies, 16, and they were split into boys and girls, and he was the feistiest one of the bunch. Bear that one in mind. His nickname is Charlie Chuckles, and I say it because he's still here. He's 12. He's lying down here at my feet. He's Charlie Chuckles. His habit, my father-in-law taught him this, that if I bark, you'll throw the ball, and it has stuck forever and a day. So he has learned that when you get a ball in your hand, if I bark, you throw it. Doesn't do it for me, but he does it for everybody else because he's taught them nicely. And training, most of his journey was primarily force free. However, at the beginning, and this is like, where do I start? He was the dog I was meant to have. He was the dog that kickstarted my training journey because the training techniques I'd used initially on Billy didn't work on him and that was a bit of a conundrum because Charlie ended up being a reactive dog as a label that you attach to a dog he became very reactive and um, he has been a work in progress and the improvements over the years of training um, have been uh, well leaps and bounds but this brings us back to Right at the beginning, chose an Irish setter. My uncle had an Irish setter as a pub dog. But what I didn't tell you is that the pub dog, there was two of them. There was a Labrador and there was an Irish red setter. And my pub, this pub got burgled one day and it was the Labrador that barked, but it was the Irish setter that pinned the burglar to the wall. So maybe I should have listened to my uncle. Um, but also he taught me that um, harnesses, he was one of my first dogs to wear a harnesses. A harness and I learned that harnesses do not make your dog pull. Training and learning would make your dog pull. The learning that the dog learns. I learn, I move, pull, I move forward, therefore pulling is what I have to do to keep moving forward. So harnesses do not make your dog pull. Learning and training does and training not to pull is also what we're trying to achieve. He's also a bloat torsion survivor so remember back to Bria, where my the breeder at the time, the one good thing that she did give me was the um, the insight and knowledge and awareness of what bloat is. He suffered bloat at the age of six. Um, he was lucky he did it with me uh, rather than my husband because I knew what was happening. And he was on the operating table within an hour of it happening. And I have never been so distressed in all my life watching a dog collapse in such distress in a surgery. He was one of only four dogs that week with bloat in the um, vets that survived and lived to tell the tale. His uh, stomach, I don't know if uh, people are aware, but bloat torsion can occur with any breed of dog, but he's very highly, it's more of a high risk within um, deep chested dogs. He's obviously a deep chested dog and bloat where they blow up, they inhale, they um, expand, they uh, take on air. And then if the stomach contents, uh, if there's any stomach contents, sometimes there is or there isn't, but the stomach can twist and flip over. So it's very much like colic in horses. They can't throw up and they can't pass out, pass uh, feces. So they just blow up and it destroys uh, the spleen and everything else. And the blood supply gets cut off to the intestines. So it is a real, it is a life threatening um, situation so being aware of it um yeah it's something i'm very passionate about so because of him um he is on permanent and as a result of it all the other dogs are he's on permanent three meals a day we've never moved off um three um purely to keep the stomach contents low in volume and he does um uh, we never exercise the dogs uh, within two hours of eating, you know, they're fed at about six o'clock in the morning and I take them for their first big primary walk at about half past nine. Then they rest and then they'll have lunch again at one and then later on for tea. So we have this rest either side of um, meals in order to reduce the potential for it to happen again. He's also the one that I've had the most insurance back on, £5,000 at the time for a bloat torsion surgery. He's also the one where if there's anything rare going to happen, it'll happen to him. So he's had the rarest of ear infections, he's had the rarest of eye infections, which all have to be sent off to a lab to be tested, to be then given the, the right medication after the veterinary normal protocols fail for about four to five attempts. He also, as a puppy, taught me about, um, here's a posh word, 
hypertrophic osteodystrophy, which is a very painful condition in uh, fast growing long legged um, animals, which setters can be. And it's where the ends of the growth plates and the heads of the bones have lots of pinprick holes and inflamed as a puppy. They, they do fill in and go. But the one thing that he did teach and was was benefiting from was he was at the beginning of my training journey when um, a lot of these veterinary trips were required and part of my training journey was to um, it's all very new and fandangled at the time was to teach your dogs to be comfortable at the vets and to have veterinary procedures done so being able to uh, have a choice in what was being done to them, i.e. it's positive, it's not bad, so rather than being forced. So he is one of the few dogs that went to um, a veterinary surgeon to have an x-ray without station. It was so busy. So I just said, well, he will lie on his back upside down if you let, if, if you let me put him in that position. He lay down on the table upside down, back and fell asleep. So it can be done. So training for veterinary procedures is also another one of my passions because of this dog. And I say there at the bottom there, you own the dog you need at the time. He was the beginning of my becoming a dog trainer journey, but I'm here to talk about setters and I mustn't move away from that. So Charlie, um, he was bought uh, primarily to do my lovely uh, gun dog training with, but because of his illnesses and his disease, and he also now has a, a very bony spinal condition as well. Agility was what we ended up doing. He loved it until that became too painful for him as well. So I ended up with a dog that I wanted, but I adapted to suit his needs. But one of the good things was, is when he had that um, HOD hypertrophic problem with his um, wrists, is I taught him to sit to a whistle. So to this day, one whistle, he's sitting. Um, so a lot of the training for the gun dogs I translated onto him. So he's under whistle control, as was Billy. And moving on now to my next setter, Dr. Watson. So meet Dr. Watson. He's um, an English setter and he's a pedigree. Uh, Hyde Parker Bungo Watson is his uh, pedigree name. He's currently uh, coming up for four years of age. Uh, they are on the vulnerable um species list at the moment um vulnerable breeds list he was one of only 602 i think it was that year born quite low his nickname is the beast he's a solid dog <laughs> his habit is eating anything and i mean anything which caused us no end of a problem when he was a puppy and his training has been entirely the apdt way and he's lovely for it. I say he gets away with an awful lot because he's a gorgeous looking dog. But uh, yeah. <laughs> so Dr. Watson, I actually call him Watson, but uh, Dr. Watson sounds nice. He's te taught me that there are a lot more emotional drivers underlying behaviour. And he came to me uh, and I again, you know, I did training plans with Charlie and Billy and Bria, and uh, he broke the mold with every one of them. He, I've never encountered such a dog that was so easily frustrated at uh, barriers. And barriers can be things like crates. And I always just assumed, you know, puppy, crate the puppy, it lasted a night, if that. He was extremely frustrated at con confinement. He is now crated but it took me a year before I could reintroduce it appropriately. And he had the emotional, uh, I don't want to say depth or not depth, but the emotional strength to be able to manage with the training of a confinement. So I always agree with crate training a puppy because that's what happens at vets. So I'd rather that they be learned and happy in a crate. So he, he has a crate now at night time. Adapt for the dog. He's taught me very much adapt for the dog. You can't force the dog into your world uh, because of his frustrations. And um, But he's also taught me, and you'll see many videos in a minute, that recall is, is freedom. For him, it's he needs, he's a birdie dog. He needs to stretch his leg. He needs that exercise. He needs to run. And he gets that because I have recall with him and Charlie. He also has loose lead walking. So loose lead walking is another thing that these guys can do. 
and it takes training it takes time Rome isn't built in a day but it gives him access he goes places like this is a train carriage um up in Norfolk steam train he, he goes on these journeys because he walks nicely I'm quite happy I'm not being dragged down the road and pulling my shoulder out he also taught me how to use video software and and do all of this sort of stuff because obviously he arrived and then the pandemic hit so I, I got up to speed so there's quite a lot of video of him unlike the other dogs um as I mentioned a minute ago crates aren't always a given I had to adapt my assumption on well, it'd be fine in a crate that wasn't a that wasn't going to happen with him and uh potty training he, he he has presented with me the most challenging dog for potty training ever uh, but that again I look back in hindsight uh, where I collected him from he had stone flooring our house is stone flooring as a puppy in his puppy plan he was peeing on stone flooring so he just learned to pee on stone flooring so he took a lot longer than my other dogs to potty train um, even though he arrived and we had the perfect timing during the summer so potty training patience and this is why we all as dog trainers occasionally get ourselves a puppy just to remind ourselves how hard having a puppy is so here's a video if you don't want a setter that needs freedom and you aren't prepared to deal with this level of grooming requirement then my advice is don't do it so uh this is watson after having run through i think it was the end of summer fields where um obviously all the seed heads and those are the prickly ones oh they're horrible uh they're awful to get out so because of this uh my dogs are all taught a lot of body handling and uh being able to stand still i go big on body handling because i want them to be able to stand still for a long time and be comfortable with it not do it because i've told them and we don't do that it's comfortable to do it because i've it's happy larry when i'm being uh, trained to stand still so one of the joys of holding of um owning setters lots of grooming requirements so here's another one. This is me doing uh, the beginnings of an instructional video for um, my um, groups on introducing how to look after ears. So you'll watch my hand goes in, he avoids, he dips, I might let go. I'm feeling for um, resistance. So if he's resisting, I'm going to immediately let go. So you'll see he's dropping his head a little bit there, but there's no resistance. I'm not physically holding him by the ear i'm just cupping the ear effectively and you'll see in a minute as we get further on there is resistance there he's pulling away and it was a lip lick there i don't know if anybody saw it, it was quick enough to see it but then take take advantage of uh, distractions now again the joys of setters look at that gloop he's been working for a little while and now he's comfortable with me opening the ears and inspecting and now i'm holding the ears open and that's it job done well done but that takes training that was that was a demonstration session for um my class uh, attendees but that takes time it's not done just like that you might spend a couple of sessions because these things matter and when they matter going slowly and investing the time is paramount for these dogs because we take these breeds on, we have to cater and allow for these things to go wrong. Therefore, we set the dog up for success for the future. Here's another one of Watson and here's me doing a canter through how to teach your dog to go into a muzzle. There's the beginning, food at the entrance to the muzzle, food in the middle of the muzzle itself. This you would spend repetitions getting going but want you to notice his tail is wagging the entire time. He's coming forward into the muzzle. I'm removing the muzzle rather than him pulling back. Thank you, Shirag Patel, by the way, for that particular piece of advice. So he's putting his nose in, fully in, and now I'm about to start feeding him from underneath with the muzzle. Still, the tail is going. It's a nice, soft, slow setter tick. See, he's got one of his harnesses on there as well. So he's trodden on his heart, his lead there. But introducing a muzzle, it's all part of owning any dog, let alone just a setter. But I like to teach all my dogs. And this just shows you that you can. They're not stubborn. They are trainable. We can do things like this for them. We are setting them up for success. 
Now my next video, excuse the um, orientation, but it was made for TikTok. That's um, our next edition. He's, he's a permanent evacuee to the country, I call him, that's Freddie. But this was about walking three dogs on a loose lead. It's not a brag. Um, it's just to show you it is possible and that there was an Irish setter, an English setter. They are lead attached to collars there because we've done a fair amount of training with uh, lead to collars. And I think my next video shows Watson as a puppy. So he's wearing his harness. This is during lockdown. Uh, excuse the words. This is how um, part of beginning steps for teaching your dog to pay attention and walk with you. The lead is loose. I've got it there attached to the front of his harness. This is just um, a little walk through. I'm keeping his attention with me. I'm saying the word yes and then reaching for my rewards. He's not doing it because I've got rewards. He's doing it and then I'm marking, saying the words yes, and then I'm delivering the reinforcer, which is food for him. The beast, he eats anything. Bit of a slip there. He's a youngster still, so um, he's not quite fully feathered and chunked up. So I'm keeping his attention with me. And what we ended up doing for this particular video was that the end result was 43 steps for only three pieces of food, I think it was. I think I counted them. So this is just me just demonstrating. He's just guiding him around. But I want you to look, the tail's wagging. He's happy, he's loose, relaxed. He's not being forced to do this. Um, he is distracted because I've got another dog off camera in a down. He's just wondering what's happening. So we're varying the pace to match him. And here I'm just adding a bit of polish to the stop with a sit. So we're going around in a figure of eight. I like figure of eights. Changes of directions are quite nice. So we go back round and then we stop. And I'm using a pole there and encouraging a stop. Good boy. So my next video, this was taken two days ago, I want to say, is at the end of a, a run out. So he's a bit shattered. Um, so he's walking next to me, his lead is attached to the collar. And uh, in a minute, you'll see the other dog ahead. He's off lead with my husband, but he's walking next to him. He's not Watson isn't being fed or rewarded there. He's being praised. And my other dog there is off lead walking. Now, I'm showing this video because there's a river to the right. And on the other side of that river, just behind us, is a field. And Watson is on a lead because I like him to habituate to I'm on a lead quite regularly past this particular field because this particular field in the summer has sheep in it. And I'm not embarrassed to say I would rather have my dog on a lead and manage a potential situation that arises rather than have him off lead and potentially set him up for failure and the sheep up for failure with him. Because there's a little bridge, footpath bridge that goes across directly to a kissing gate onto their field. It's not fair on the sheep. It's distressing and upsetting to sheep. It's also distressing and upsetting to sheep more even if the dog is walking with you, that they're not on a lead. There's, there's research paper out on that. So rather than set him up for, for failure, he's always set up for success in that he's on a lead when we're walking past that field. So he expects that every single time. So that I'm quite happy to do those sorts of management styles. So I want to talk through, I'll shut up because there's a whistle involved in a minute. not always successful this is my whistle recall now watch the nose suddenly catch whoosh something's caught my attention so I try him again and I do a visual signal this time to say here I am please come to me so it's to show it can be done I don't mind that he went off piece there it doesn't bother me he's he's a dog I'm human 
we occasionally have failures like that and I don't see it as a failure he came back to me just got slightly distracted but he came on the second recall so that's him recalling that's across our golf course but because he will come when I call him he has that freedom but that freedom was long trained and hard earned so that isn't taught within a day and you'll see I'm about to reward him here and I'm just going to go on to this one as well same thing blow the whistle the cockapoo his recall is on point as well he's still fairly new he's come back so you will see and hear him eating I always get asked when do I have to when do I stop having to feed my dog when he comes back or when do I have to stop playing with him so Charlie's taught um, to play tuggy on return when do I have to stop rewarding him and I'm always a fan of well when do you not want that behavior to continue to work I always reward my dogs for a recall in some format or another be that primary food for this one or playing games with Charlie or playing games with both of them or run or chase me. I've always got something that if I think you've done an amazing recall, I will reward that behavior because I want you to do it again next time. I don't want it to fall apart. So even if I've got no food on me, I've still got me. I can jump and be a hooli or run around or I can turn my lead into a tuggy toy and play tuggy because why not? He's done a job. I've asked him to do something and he's done it. So why not have the reinforcer? So here's another one. He's just come from behind me in a big circle sweeping now. I didn't include that because it was pitch black onto the trees. So now he's coming back. So he gets freedom. But what I'm doing is I'm constantly watching. Is there something that could set him up for failure? If so, I'll call him closer and then maybe work through it. Still young for a setter. They don't properly mature until they're about hey, five. Boy. Yeah. Time's out. Um, so this is Charlie early on. This was a dog who, um, this is a tiny section of a training um, thing I had to do, which is to teach a dog to retrieve to hand. So as you can tell, he's a youngster there. Good boy. You heard a clicker being used there. I'm feeding him and praising him. That was a new behavior. That was taught from the very beginning with an object on the floor and him just even being nosy and touching it with his nose. That took, uh, I think it took 15 steps in a training plan and was shaped incrementally using a clicker and being rewarded. And I'm actually layering on some praise as well. So it can be done. He wasn't a natural retriever. He wasn't something that would um, an animal that would like to put anything in his mouth apart from a ball. So I had to teach him. I, if I ask you to go and collect something that you bring it back to my hand, I will reinforce. And that effectively is the underlying that pins underneath my recall, which is come touch my hand. Come here. I am. Come touch my hand, which is what I teach most of my recalls from the beginning with as well now so it's not all about the behaviors you need this is charlie doing a reverse back round me he loves to learn he really does he's an adorable dog he was a dream to teach and there's the young youngster peering in and finally i've got a few, just a couple more dogs will be dogs and if you don't want to set up and you're not prepared to give your dog this sort of freedom. I love it. I love when my dogs come back from a walk absolutely filthy dirty because they've had a good time. This is up at the adventure park that I run and every winter we get a puddle. We call it the lake. And uh, I love it. You can see it's absolutely filthy. Granddad Charlie's a bit more sensible. <laughs> so that for me is a wrap. That's Charlie doing our Prince Bow. And before I just close it completely, if you're looking for any further support for training your setters, then choose any APDT trainer because the training techniques we need are mostly all across the board. The only unique features of setters is that they are really into birds and bird scenting. 
So just that body language that you're looking for that differentiates a setter that potentially is taking in the air versus a Labrador who's going, where's the next retrieve item? That's possibly the only difference in the body language and the way in the style which they tick their tail. But there are some excellent groups in Facebook, Setter Training and Behaviour UK. It's uh, I'm, I'm one of the moderators on that uh, group. It's we encourage positive and force free. It is a great place to go to ask for help and advice. And one of the other moderators, I follow her Facebook group on um, her Facebook for her one of her setters, Hobson, and it's called the Daily Hobson. And if you want irrelevant titter and a laughter, go watch that page. Absolutely brilliant. He's now got a little sort of sidekick called Elmo or Smelmo, as he calls him. Love it. Brilliant. That's run by Pennell Mulby. And finally, there is another Facebook group, Canine Bloat Awareness, which, as I say, isn't specific it's more common in setters but any dog can suffer from it and i think every dog owner and dog trainer should be aware of uh spreading the word about canine bloat awareness so without further ado i didn't realize i was going to go on for so long but i could talk all day about them any questions thanks denise that was really interesting um love hearing about your dogs um i think everyone else did as well there's some real like comedy gold moments in there yeah you can't not have a sense of humor if you own one of these beasts <laughs> and i mean looking back to my kind of teenage i was a teenager in the 90s sorry um and um red setters were definitely like a dog of the 80s and 90s there were a lot of them about weren't there and now you hardly see them yeah, I mean, uh, of, of all the setter breeds, they are the most prolific. Um, so the Gordon setter, the Irish red and white is the worst one. And then there's the English in terms of they are a vulnerable native breed. And that is in part informed our choice for um, Watson, because when Billy went, uh, I, I wasn't prepared to lose, you know, a setter and only having one setter in the house at the time. It was not normal. It's not normal. And uh, we thought we won't have a Gordon, but um, it informed our choice. And I thought, no, I'm going to support a vulnerable native breed. Yeah. So I sought out uh, the, you know, the English setter and uh, we've, been, we've been blessed with Watson. But um, yeah, they are. They, yeah, I, I do make a comedy. I should I didn't mention it, but Bria, you'll probably have noticed is a bitch. Every yeah. other dog since then has been a boy. <laughs> she was the reason we went, I'm never having a bitch again. But having said that, with all the knowledge I now have, actually, we'll be discussing our next dog, our next setter. It will be a setter. Our next setter um, is probably going to be a bitch, I think, this time round. Yeah, so we'll go back to being having a bitch. So, yeah, I think people have their preferences, don't they, sometimes with sex? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I thought, no, I'll go for that. I'll go for a girl this time, next time round. So um, Wendy, who's been watching on YouTube, has a kind of, I'm not sure if there's a co if there's a question in there, Wendy, but she's struggling with getting her dog out of the house. So if I bring the first comment up, it says, Odin, Irish, yeah. 18 months, growls, and if he can, hides in the crate when I go to put his collar on for a walk. He is good in the car and loves his walks once out, but hates the idea of leaving the house. And then as a follow on to that, there's a bit more, um, just okay. for everybody else. I've tried different collars, once in collar and lead. He's happy to follow me out, no problem. I've used treats. He isn't food orientated and ear rubs, which he loves, but it has never changed. Okay, so that's potentially um, uh, sort of, uh, I would say, it has an emotional component to it. And wherever we talk about things like this, uh, whilst I have done a master's in clinical animal behaviour as a dog trainer, this is something where I would point you towards a behaviourist, a clinically um, certified behaviourist. But to me, this potentially sounds like there is a load, loaded um, uh, impact from the dog's perspective with possibly the reach to the collar and what in the past that may have meant for him so i always say um things like just what is now and what you've tried and differently if the dog predicts or has an association with something that he didn't like in the past or it led to something he didn't like then that reaching for his collar may be the loaded 
element to this. So it's not necessarily the collar he wears. It might even be attached to the fact that you're reaching into his safe space if it's a collar, if it's a crate that you're reaching in, because if he's going off into that, that might be a safe space. So I am a fan of listening to my dogs, which is if my dog is doing that, then I need to listen to that. It's it's giving me a, a message which says I'm either avoiding what is about to happen or I'm avoiding what this means or all these sorts of things, which is why talking about and answering questions over the internet, you need to see the pictures, you need to see the videos, you need to see what is it that sort of leads up to this event happening. So I would be doing things like, well, waiting him out, and maybe going and standing by the door and maybe doing uh, loaded um, lead on, lead off exercises where the lead goes on, I feed you, the lead comes off, I feed you, the lead goes on. So you start to desensitize them, but not in the environment where potentially it's loaded with uh, emotions underneath it. Mm -hmm. Excellent, yeah. Um, okay, Laura's got a, um, there's a little comment here. I'll just bring on, uh, yeah, Laura's got a bit of a question. Kim said, this has been really interesting. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Our setter was our first dog and I have to say that he, that I didn't do much research. He was a rescue from Greece. He's adorable and such a lovely nature, but he is quite reactive. This has really taught me that with some work, we can hopefully crack things. That's lovely to hear. Yeah. I mean, I like that because uh, Charlie wasn't, you know, nobody buys a dog that's going to end up being labelled as what he ended up being labelled as. And um, a knowledge, knowledge, and you look back and you reflect on things and you go, well, of course, why didn't, I couldn't see that. I didn't know this information. It wasn't out there, body language, what he was telling me. And we now know actually there's, is possibly like, God bless insurance. That's all I can say. God bless insurance because he's had all of the issues going and pain. We know pain uh, and behaviour are linked without a doubt, mm -hmm. you know, 80% um, up to 80% of cases of behaviour or misbehaviour um, are linked to um, pain. And he's one of them. Mm. Um, so Laura's got a question. What differences in trainability and personality would you say there are between Gordon's English and Irish setters? none <laughs> oh, that was quick there we go that was quick so for me um the, G the gordon setter she was an absolute dream to teach to be a clicker train to click a train she was absolutely on point but we didn't really have that much of a relationship because she would bugger off when we were over the field but then again when we we're over the field i didn't work on slowly and i mean really slowly teaching a recall properly so it was just like call your dog and get your dog back and you think well what are all the steps in between that to achieve it so for her she 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 benefited from clicker training i benefited from going oh there's something new to learn here she, she she loved it um but it was she had the motivation she liked food and it's just like billy billy liked food but he also really enjoyed the, the pleasure of uh doing working so you know at the local park i'd go and hide food in the bush to start with and then it translated to helping him learn to carry objects so then i'd go and hide the objects in the he loved to do because it meant he was with you. So he had a really nice, um, he was, I think um, you would call him a robust nature. I was blessed to have that sort of a dog. And Charlie, um, so Irish, two Irish setters, people used to say, how do you tell them apart? And you go, well, it's easy, I, I, very easy. Can't you see the difference? It's like having twins. But you couldn't get two more extremes of the bell curve of behaviors for, for setters. So you know he's a dream to teach anything new to he he has a different relationship to me i mean he's my heart dog billy was my husband's heart dog and so he's my heart dog and because he's a dream but he has issues which are also managed i manage those issues so and the english setter um he uh, he has challenged me to find a different way to motivate a dog um so he he food i mean food food all day and every day however it's not shouldn't all be be about food it should be about the other things so um we play tuggy so he's taught to go retrieve pick it up come back and we'll play tuggy as a reward so he has tuggy but in terms of trainability any dog is trainable once you find the right motivator as the reinforcer for the behaviour? Absolutely. So, great question. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and then uh, one from Penel. When people adopt a setter from abroad, what should they be aware of? Okay, hi Penel. Um, so great question. So a setter from abroad, 99% of the setters that come in from abroad are uh, of working stock, working. Um, so whereas my setters are all show dogs, um, they are very drivey. They are potential. I mean, this is really generic dumping everything into one big bubble. They're likely to have had a, a lot of bird game training. Therefore, when you take on a rescue setter from a board, uh, it's almost management for the first, uh, for first, I want to say couple of years, you'll be managing and working on your recall and attention to you to try to switch not necessarily switch that nose off, but engage that nose such that you're in control of that nose and what that nose does. So that golf course where you saw me recall uh, Watson and then he had a spin round and what's this? That golf course, I use a lot of the thickets for, all right, okay, you're gonna go hunting over there. Actually, I want you to hunt here instead. Hunt here, hunt here. So I then become the source of, oh, mum's found the good stuff. Mum knows where the good stuff is. So you, it's more about building a close relationship with them. But yeah, they are potentially very, uh, very drivey, very drivey, very driven, very centre orientated and likely to, the bird is more important than you are to start with. So it takes a while to change the relationship that you're, you're there. And also, it's a bit unfair, but it's a bit, um, we don't know the history of how they were taught and trained. So there can also be some loading behind that and what you're trying to change and unpick. Right. Um, next question from Lorraine. Will you get a red and white next? Do you know what kind of set are you going to get next? No, no, we're not. However, um, we did... We did really seriously, we were really this close to getting a red and white before we got Watson. Uh, so I did research, but and there was during lockdown, I think, uh, I think it was about 10 born that year, I think. The Irish red and white is the one that's the most at risk of all of the setter groups. And um, yeah, I might consider it, I might. Great. <laughs> um, and two sort of questions from the same person which are related. Um, from Andrea, amazing presentation. Any books you can recommend? We have a rescue working English setter, and we're trying to transition our setter from being a working bird hunter in Italy to a pet in UK. Do you have any leads to help our research journey? So, two so, things. Two things. So, um, trying to transition from being a working bird hunter. So, a really good um, book. Click a gun dog, weirdly, um, which is by Helen Phillips. I, I turn immediately behind because this is all my <laughs> dog training books. <laughs> um, so click a gun dog training, anything that's positive. So um, uh, there's a recall, um, rapid, not rapid recall. I can't remember the name. It's gone straight out of my really head. Really reliable. Really reliable recall. Yes. So mm -hmm. that teaches very slow steps. And that's um, one of the ways that I teach my whistle recall for my dogs or one of those. But I really do recommend that if you're in, just drop into the behavior group on Facebook and you'll get, oh, there's loads of recommendations for books in there. And you were trying to transition the setter from being a working bird hunter. So I would be teaching um, to work and find um stuff that you might start setting up and planting so you start turning things into close gains rather than uh, because they're very independent they are bred to range find and wait for you to catch up with them and if they don't find they'll keep running until they find and so partly that's your recall and um getting those games that are quite close to you but no drop into that group because in there there's loads of advice and recommendations and files as well in there and um i know that penel is in the comments so we we can't put the link in right now but if you want to put the link in penel you're welcome to okay um we've got quite a few questions so i'm trying to get through them so i'm a bit <laughs> conscious of time um okay so jackie sort of asks our 11 month old irish has taken to crouching down when approached by other dogs when on lead what is he telling me so it's called an evaluation 
Um, it's nothing to do with dominance and submission. Nothing at all to do with that. It's to, it's they're evaluating what's happening, and they're, and they're crouched down. It's like an over exaggeration of a set. They've seen something moving. It just happens to be right, wrong target, right action, wrong target. They're crouching down and they're evaluating. And if you're down on the floor, you're less of a target as well. So it's like anticipation. What am I going to do? So that's the sort of thing where I might. I always allow my setters a little bit longer than most. I allow them to look at something and think about it and then change their minds. So it's about three seconds, a three beat. And depending on what their flus are doing, whether they're puffing their cheeks out and they're scenting, I might actually have to intervene uh, visually to get their attention back on me. So I try to work on, well, I'm letting you look at it. You're going to think about it. Now I need to change your mind on this. If you don't already do that yourself so that would be where i would maybe walk away maybe change their mind go in a different direction ask them to perform something that you've taught like a um, a hand target or a, a middle go between your legs sort of thing don't know if that helps <laughs> um what age do you think english setter starts to mature if they ever do on my ninth <laughs> and tenth and i'm still not sure get another english wink from sally <laughs> <laughs> keep going until you get the right one so i i was um physically so i go with this on physically for physically most setters don't really mature physically until they're about five so uh it literally was uh billy um we used to have a playground with metal bars and as a pup my vet used to say if i didn't know you i would say he was an abuse victim he was so skinny mm -hmm. that he could walk through these metal bars but he didn't literally, literally the year he turned five he just went i'm a boy and he chunked up, and his feathers were beautiful. He was stunning. And I think that goes emotionally as well. I don't think that they emotionally mature. I think they um, are quite slow to emotionally mature. And so you're still a nice, there's a nice training window for up to about mm. five years. <laughs> um, and we'll have this last one from Jackie Lewis. Is there an ideal age gap to introduce a second dog, possibly an English setter? Guessing she's got a little, a very old Irish going by yeah. that profile pics. So um, I would seek a trainer's advice on this because how are you introduce them? So I introduced uh, Watson to my old boy who at the time was, uh, where are we? It was about nine or eight. Bearing in mind he's a grumpy goop. So I um, had a play pen, puppy play pen, and I used to protect the, the older boy from the puppy mm -hmm. so that the older boy wasn't being bothered and I would do management at a distance but in terms of age gap I I usually do about three years if I go to follow I would do three to four years because by then you've got you're good you're coming up to I've got a fairly reliable training with my other dog because if you get multiple dogs you have to walk multiple dogs at the same time and that video you saw that's a constant work mm. I still work on I need you to walk nicely how can i set this up so you succeed and so it's a constant work in progress because the moment you get a pair of dogs walking together it becomes a beast of five <laughs> yeah but no I, so yeah i i used to do about three three to four years but if i'm introducing a, a puppy to an older boy really look to protect the older one um over the youngster great um I think that's everything. There's a couple of comments in there. Sally just said, um, I should have listened to Penel. She advised not to get to the same age. I've got two adolescents. Yeah, adolescents. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I don't know if we've got anybody talking about adolescents this month, but yes. We have, we have, we have. Brilliant. Oh, fab. Yeah. That's good. We've got some good good talks coming out and one of them is about adolescents. So that's like I say, cool. I'm not an expert on setters. I just fell into them the wrong way i've had experience of them and i'm just i just hooked by them and apart from the interloper is evacuee to the country which is the little cockapoo but he's lovely he's fitted in beautifully excellent great um okay. thank you so much denise is there anything you want to just say in closing is there anything else you want people to know about they can contact you through your business red dog training Yep. So you can contact me through Red Dog Training, Irish Red Setters, and um, uh, if you need any help. But the best place to go is a, is that gr Facebook group that um, UK Setter Training and Behaviour, and uh, just be mindful of your trainer that you choose and that they are 
kind and positive and fair and effective because these these dogs no no you need to uh you they need care and attention and and uh yeah you get the best out of them excellent well, thank you thank Denise. you very much thanks so much thank you so this week coming up we don't have a live tomorrow we have a live on tuesday it's going to be about shaping wednesday will be about adolescence um thursday will be all about teaching your dog to settle um and more and more so that's just a little bit of a flavor of what we've got coming up for you this week and hope to see lots of you there we have really good attendance tonight denise i think we had 40 on facebook 25 on youtube so wow. good. <laughs> thank you everyone good. okay have thank a you. lovely evening Bye.